talked about a lot this past year. <clears throat> this is Billy the Kid and the Tim Type. Everybody in this audience is going to see and be a part of American History Tonight. Hit 500,000, that'll get 500, now 5 can be. Hit 550,000, 600,000, now 650,000, that's now 650,000. I'm now 7, now 50, 750,000, 750,000, now 800,000, 800, now 900,000, now 1 million dollars, 1 million one, 1 million two. No, no, you're out, Tom, got a million two. A million two, got to be a million two hundred thousand, a million two. I got a million one, got to be a million two, a million three, a million four, a million four. One million seven fifty, the lowest I'm going to go. One eight. One eight, one nine, one eight, one nine, now two million, now two million, two million one. Got to be two million one. Every summer my family uh, took a road trip to Iowa and we were on Route 66 and my dad wouldn't stop for anything. And we went by this place and it was called the Longhorn Museum and it was 43 miles east of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so he actually stopped there and I went in and here was this picture and it said it was Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid and I bought it and I was just thrilled. I put it up in my room, I studied it, I wanted to have a hat like that and coat like that. And then not long after, I discovered in pages of True West Magazine, the photo was a fake. It just made me so mad that I wanted to find out what did Billy the Kid, what was he really like? And so that was really the spark that led me on my way. Actually, my dad, he used to get True West, and Frontier Times, and all them way back when. And he always had a pile of them there. And so, yeah, and so you see these articles and this stuff. And then years later, I got a commission uh, to do uh, some Billy the Kid paintings and then saw how bizarre the story was and how many sides and then the, it's like what a historian has, an investigator, you get this instinct to find out, to separate the bull corn from the, the real deal. Like a lot of people I was first impressed by the movies and TV, uh, you know I grew up in the 50s which is the age of the TV western and uh, you know, I, I didn't know any of these people were real. Uh, in fact, I was one night I was watching the Wyatt Earp series at U O'Brien, and my dad happened to walk through the room and said, "You know, he's a real guy." I was shocked. 
So I wanted to know the real stuff. And my dad brought me back the saga of Billy the Kid from the library. And I uh, read that, was fascinated by it. When I was a kid, um, I was about 11 years old, and there was a TV show on, it was a Western, and it was very romantic, it was made for young girls. And I fell into the trap, and I, I fell in love with Billy. And so I just started researching and I read Billy's story and not just about his legend, but about his life and also about his friends and about their lives and their stories. And I became really fascinated with the Lincoln County War. And uh, for my 21st birthday, my mom said, what, what do you want? It's a big birthday. And I said, I want to go to New Mexico. I said, don't get me anything else. Don't get me anything for Christmas. We just need to go to New Mexico. The first encounter with Billy the Kid was when I brought my wife and two kids up here to see the places where it had all happened. They'd known about Billy the Kid from me for a long time because I was living in England writing about Billy the Kid there. And it was raining and Lincoln was closed. And it took us about an hour to find anybody who could tell us anything at all. And it was drizzling and it was miserable. And my wife said, you brought me 5,000 miles to see this and I eventually persuaded her that it was interesting. And we've been delving into the life and times of Billy the Kid and everybody associated with him for the past, believe it or not, 50 years. And we still don't know who he was. He was an unconventional outlaw. Um, certain things about his personality uh, were quite fascinating and uh, I think he was genuinely a pretty bad guy. He was an outlaw of sorts, but he had a side to him that was interesting, a little different than other outlaws, and that became very interesting to me. I was reading Fred's book, West of Billy the Kid, and uh, he had a line in it about the, the escape of the kid, and he talked about uh, how we probably never know what happened in the courthouse. Once the kid and Bell went into the courthouse, he said, we'll probably never know what happened. Well, by that time, the Sullivan came in, the sheriff came in, and <laughs> I was had my feet propped up, and I'm reading this book, and, and I told him, I said, I want, to, I want to do an investigation into the kid. I want to look at that. He said, everybody's written about it. You know, everybody and their dog's written about it. And I said, yeah, but they don't look at it like cops look at it. This is what we do. We, Every crime scene is a cold one. You know, it, it was the Young Guns 2 movie, and it was like a two by four hit me upside the head. It really had such an impact on me. I couldn't explain why, it's just that I came home, and um, it was like something was haunting me or something. You know, I was just uh, walking around in a daze trying to figure out how do I get to the bottom of this? I don't get it. I didn't even really know anything about him when I first came to start thinking that I needed to come down to Lincoln County. I didn't really even know anything about Billy the Kid or that he even existed. Um, I just kept getting these pulls that I needed to come down here and check out Lincoln County. I knew about Billy, but it. Uh... It wasn't one of those characters that, uh, that really grabbed me. I uh, was into General Custer and Custer's Last Stand, Davy Crockett and the Alamo, and that's, that's sort of what really fascinated me. When I came to New Mexico back in 1984, uh, here I was in Billy the Kid Country, so of course I had to start uh, exploring it. But I didn't want to go there, because down that road lies madness. Well, the real story of Billy the Kid is a story replete with uh, romance. Um, it is a tale that is sort of a metaphor in a lot of ways for the end of the pastoral period of the West, the coming of the railroads and corporations. And uh, Billy the Kid is this young man who refuses to compromise, who refuses to give in to you know, the machine in the garden that's coming, uh, and who plays his uh, sort of rebellious string out to the end. It's sort of, he, he, 
he's a hopeless romantic in a way because he's fighting for a way of life that is that is passing away. He's only 21 when he's killed, so he doesn't have a lot of time to engage in this battle. But his youth, his daring, his uh, his rebellious spirit, all of this appeals, I think, to. Uh, to the sort of romantic spirit in people. My idea of the kid was that he, you know, stood in the street and dared people to draw and there was wanted posters and he robbed trains and banks and he never robbed a bank and he never robbed a train. He never stood in the street and dared anybody to draw and his real name was Henry. It wasn't even Billy, you know, and I was like, how many movies would you go see about Henry the Kid? Not very many, not 60 for sure. Then as I got deeper into the story, uh, just realizing the rough men that he rode with and, and had to, um, you know, uh, contend with and, and survive because these are some mean guys, man. These guys are still had the bark on, as they used to say. To me, Billy represents uh, a certain defiance of authority, which I like. Uh, he's, but at the same time, he's he had personality coming out of his ears, which is a real key to his legend too. He had a lot of friends. He had a lot of people hiding him through New Mexico and who would keep him safe. But he had so many enemies, too, that it was just hard. There's two sides of the story. Some people loved him, some people hated him. But I think a lot of people loved him. In a, in a way, he's the, he's the ultimate American hero. Because uh, even though we as Americans believe very strongly in law and order, um, we also are born out of rebellion, and we love to root for the rebel. And Billy, of course, finally has to pay the price. Uh, his friends admired him. He was a natural leader. He showed that. Even at his young age, he became a natural leader of men um, older than he, and they respected him. He was very young, so he had to survive. He had to do whatever it took, and, uh, and that takes a lot of gumption. Bottom line, I see him more as tr attempting to prevail as a freedom fighter, quote unquote, then, you know, just stay. Um, I want to kill people just to be killing them because I want a few coins and I want another bottle of whiskey or something, you know, yeah, no. <laughs> Either you see the kid as a dirt bag that needs to be killed that shouldn't be breathing air as common people, or you see him as this romantic hero, uh, Robin Hood kind of thing. And I think the way we should look at the kid is he's a guy. He's just like us. Out of the fire come this innocent looking little kid uh, who was not. He took the side of Tunstall and the side of the Mexican people against the Anglo that had taken their country, the corrupt Anglos, the murdering Anglos. So from the get-go, Billy the Kid was perceived, at least, as a freedom fighter, Irish freedom fighter, fighting for their cause. Well, I think that the part of the legend that endures is that you have this innocent looking boy who is hanging with men who are, are so rough. And that's part of the eternal charm. Uh, when we read that perhaps Billy had grown a beard on the night he was killed, and the newspaper reported that, uh, we don't like to read that. It was like, no, 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 this, our boy is clean shaven and he can't even raise a beard. That's because he's that young. And that's why a nine year old boy from Iowa would be enamored of him because here he is, he's, he's just like I am. And so that's the charm. I think it was his character. I think he was a he was a loyal person, he was loyal to his friends, and despite being physically slight and being young, I think that he was brave, and I think he really cared about these people. Uh, the way that he grew up, um, I, I don't think he had a, a really strong sense of family. And so when he met these guys, they were his brothers. They were family to him. And so he was willing to, to do anything for them. And I think that's probably the coolest thing about Billy. And I think that's something that gets forgotten a lot. I think you can identify, he can identify with you and you can identify with him if you've ever had a tough time in your life. Because the, the tough times that he went through were pretty serious. And you can look at them and say, well, I guess if he can get through that kind of shooting up, I can get through this. And so that's an encouragement to a viewer. Looking around it the other way, he, he's, he's a very unlikely hero. He isn't particularly good looking. 
uh, although everybody said he was very charming and, and very easy to get along with. But he was just another guy from nowhere. And still, to, to this day, is a man from nowhere. We don't know where he came from. We don't know how he got that self-confidence and poise that he clearly had. And he obviously didn't have any fear whatsoever because he walked straight into the biggest gunfights that ever happened in these parts. See, yeah, that's where you really have to give him credit. You know, he stood toe to toe with a lot of really tough characters who are twice his age and held his own. You know, that's, and that's saying something. That's what made him a fascinating character. He was young. He was ev evidently had a, a very jovial personality. He knew how to get along with people and people liked him. He laughed a lot. He danced a lot. He had a good time in his life. But he also had this very dark side to him. But it's, it's kind of, I think his attitude, you know, he was young and he was, you know, kind of happy and fun loving, but yet don't mess with him. And, you know, maybe those blue eyes told that story that, <laughs> yeah, I can be smiling, but don't mess with me, you know. There is a lot of mystery in the story of the kid. There's a lot we don't know. Uh, we may never know. And that simply fuels the imagination and it allows, uh, it allows both the writer, be it a film writer or someone writing a book or an article or, or, or the artist who's, who's making a sculpture or a painting, it, it allows some freedom uh, within their craft. And so that makes him appeal, a very appealing subject for the artist. I think what happened, I, I think Billy the Kid became Billy the Kid April 28, 1881, was the escape the courthouse. That's when he became Billy the Kid. Had they hung him May 13th, he'd have been a footnote in history like the rest of it. He was, he was, he was an entertainer, really was, in the old dances they'd have, you know, the bales they called them. It wasn't just dancing and music. It, it, this was the only time you had to socialize and talk. So it was storytelling and a joke you heard and so-and-so did that and I heard about old so-and-so. So it was a whole time to uh, share news, all that kind of stuff. And that, that was a social gathering, the dance. So the kid had come with a reputation who was a hell of a dancer and very magnetic and all that stuff. He had the juice. And oh God, the Mexican girls were just nuts about him. And the Mexican men loved him too. But Billy the Kid appeals to different people for totally different reasons. Some like the, the daring do, as they would call it in England. Some people like the mystery. Some people like the war in which he found himself embroiled. Some people like the idea of being the fastest gun in Texas, except it wasn't Texas, it was New Mexico. There's always a new facet to the story, and it never stops turning up new facets, no matter how fast we use them up. He was, uh, he was outgoing, and he was popular, and he liked to talk and sing and dance, and uh, he, he liked girls, and, and good for him, they liked him back. You and I would say, the kind of kid you'd want for your own son. I almost felt like it was my life or something, or some component of something that was like a switch just went off and I had to follow it. Uh, his story, it just gets under your skin. When you first start reading it, there's just something about him. He's heroic and daring and flashy and fun. And you just love the sense that he did everything he could to protect his friends. That's probably the biggest part of it. And he is, uh, he was just treated so badly by Lou Wallace for not giving him the pardon. He was gunned down in a darkened bedroom. The whole story is just epic. <laughs> this whole story is like a Ulysses story. It's a great story. It's about deceit and love and dying for love and passion and right and wrong. And it just has all these elements. Uh, I'm as fascinated by the legend of the kid, by why the kid is such a towering figure in American and, and world mythology, uh, as I am with the real kid, which is a, a fascinating story, but it's really what we've made of him, this outlaw of our dreams, that has most fascinated me. I think what we do is we get legends. We, we, we start seeing the kid as a legend. And all of a sudden, it becomes like a religion. I believe this, so I wrote a book about it, and oh, I don't want to rock the boat. And 
I think it's because we can't really separate ourselves from the legend and who these guys were. Well, what's wonderful is, is that there's new finds all the time. And we just, uh, Mark Lee Gardner, the author of uh, To Hell on a Fast Horse, he discovered online now, since so many newspapers are being put up online, he discovered a newspaper account that we thought was lost. And it was uh, published in a paper in Colorado uh, just after the kid's death. And we published that in True West because uh, it was just so exciting to see so clearly and so soon after his death, uh, so many of the tropes, so many of the uh, things we believe about the kid today were right there immediate. This is like a week after his death. Well, I'd probably the single most important thing to come out was in 1986 when they discovered the, uh, the photo, the tintype of the kid, because up until that all we had was a lot of retouched old bad, bad, bad photos. And uh, But when that came out you could finally see the his actual face and what he really looked like, at least to some extent, because the problem being with the, with the only known photo of the kid is that people who knew him said it was a terrible picture of him. So he's basically being remembered by his driver's license photo. That's a real touchstone to the past. I mean, that is the, that is the actual shadow caught uh, of Billy the Kid. Uh, first time I saw it was right here in Lincoln, where at that time it was briefly on display under arc lights <laughs> and uh, didn't do it any good, I think. And uh, I was privileged to even hold it in my hand. And that's quite something for a little boy from Liverpool, England, to, to come to Lincoln County and find he can do. When that picture was taken, they doctored it, okay? They tried to repair it from the get-go. And that is and it was badly done, it was botched. And so what you saw, instead of this smart little Irish kid, you saw a moron. And so America only heard of this dirty little Billy killer, and there's his picture, look, he's a moron. Well, nothing was farther from the truth. If you look at it and carefully examine it, you know, a lot of people think he just looks like an idiot when they first look at it, but if you look at it really closely, you can see there's intelligence there. I was appalled by the fact that it sold for two and a half million because it, as you probably know, and if you don't, it's easy enough to explain, everybody who finds a picture that looks remotely like him immediately runs to the press or to the, anybody who will listen and say, hey, look, I got a picture of Billy the Kid. The matter of its going into collectorship and therefore out of sight of us for the rest of its existence is, is to me, is very sad. I'd like an awful lot of people to be able to see it because it's magic. Uh, it's hard to explain the, the lunacy that seems to surround the kid with modern uh, enthusiasts, but uh, it's, it's easy to be drawn to him because, uh, as I said earlier, he's a, you know, he's a, he's kind of a symbol of rebellion. Uh, you know, he kind of went against authority and uh, especially corrupt authority, and uh, and for that, you know, it's admir He's admirable. Um, I, I think over and over, as corny as it sounds, he made decisions out of love, out of kindness, because he cared about people. I think that's why he got involved in the Lincoln County War. I think it was because of his loyalty to Tunstall and to the other guys who were involved, and that's why he stuck around when he didn't have to, and that's why he did the things he did. How he became the legend, that has to do with my line of business. We make legends, writers make legends, and I think there were enough writers around shortly after Billy's death and kept on going to the present day. And I'm sure when we're all turned up our shoes and gone, there'll be others coming along to do it all over again. Billy, I think, is a good, he's sort of like a mirror to the people who are interested in him. Uh, he as a person is, is pretty well documented and uh, he was an exciting, cool person. But I think now, um, he's whatever you want him to be. On the anniversary of his death in Fort Sumner, we had a reenactment of his funeral and I gave the eulogy. I cried a little bit because it was just very sad and we just really want people to know how we see Billy the Kid, that he wasn't a murderer, he wasn't a cold-blooded, horrible human being. He was an outlaw, yes, and he killed people, yes, but he wasn't a bad guy. And maybe we all just put into him what 
we need him to be. That's a possibility I don't really know. He certainly has been a very resilient and, and a very malleable character uh, for America. He could be the hero of the oppressed uh, small farmers in the 1930s. He could be the hero of the angst-ridden, misunderstood teenagers of the 1950s. And he could be a tough uh, gang leader, uh, sort of the LA Crips go to New Mexico in Young Guns in the 1990s, uh, just keeps riding across the imagination of America and the world.